Hello and welcome. My name is John Horvath. And my presentation today is about heat transfer in geostructural systems. Here's an outline of my presentation. I have divided things up into segments in order to present the material in a logical fashion. Uh, for you, the viewer, you may find it advantageous to break up your viewing into uh, segments uh, to fit the time that you have available. Well, let me begin by some background, with some background as to how this presentation came to be, why I decided to make it. I've been thinking about doing this presentation for quite a long time now. Uh, and the reason is that the topic of heat transfer in civil engineering is, in my opinion, not addressed to any meaningful extent in traditional academic coursework, uh, at least here in the United States. And I say this from personal firsthand experience, both from being a student many years ago, as well as having been involved in academia for a good part of my professional career. I can recall that as an undergraduate that uh, I took a course in thermodynamics that was taught by an instructor from the mechanical engineering department. And really there, there was nothing that was presented in that course that was directly applicable to civil engineering. Whatever I have come to learn about heat transfer in civil engineering applications has been self-taught. Uh, about a decade after I finished school, I was involved in a number of projects that uh, kind of forced me to do on-the-job training and learning, as it were. I think this is a significant educational deficiency that needs to be rectified, as there are quite a few civil engineering applications, especially in geotechnical and structural engineering, with which I am most familiar, where heat transfer significantly impacts how the overall geotechnical system or structure behaves in service, and thus impacts how the system or structure should be analyzed or designed. I think that this educational need will, uh, for knowledge about heat transfer will only increase in the future with a greater focus on what we call the carbon footprint of engineered construction, as well as the use of energy foundations, where foundation engineering and heat transfer are inherently linked and interdependent. So the purpose of this presentation is to provide you with a practice-oriented primer on heat transfer in what I call geostructural systems. And this is based on my personal professional experience with a wide variety of heat transfer applications that go back to about 1980. So I've been doing this for some time now. I do want to emphasize that this is practice-oriented, although I've spent a good part of my career in academia, this is not an overly theoretical uh, presentation, simply because the work I've done with heat transfer and geostructural applications has always been practice-oriented. Uh, let me first define what I mean by a geostructural system as I use it in this presentation. I'm talking about systems that are predominantly geotechnical in nature, but generally have some type of structure or at least a structural element that interacts with the ground. And this could be anything from a pavement or a retaining wall or a building. As we'll see, the atmosphere is the primary heat source of interest in most geostructural applications. Uh, where heat transfer is a primary consideration, although in some cases it is the structure itself that is the primary heat source of interest. And I'll, of course, give you some examples of this. Well, let's move on next to an overview of the presentation. My focus is on the mechanics of heat transfer through solid materials, both natural and manufactured as well as particulate materials such as soil that, as we'll see, can be accurately modeled as a quasi-solid, at least for heat transfer purposes. Uh, and of course, we do this very often with soil. I mean, we apply equations of 
continuum mechanics theory of theory of elasticity for continuums or solids we apply that to uh, masses of soil as we'll see this is what is called conductive heat transfer now the presentation and discussion of thermal material properties and the governing partial differential equations for conductive heat transfer are completely generic so you could apply the concepts I'll talk about to a wide variety of problems now that having been said when I get to talk about how one evaluates material properties and actually go to use and solve these uh, equations in practice I, I'm going to focus on geostructural systems And because of the international audience, I will use both imperial and SI units uh, for thermal material properties and related parameters. And I, I've done a lot of work with SI units uh, as well as imperial units in heat transfer. So I, I will talk about the units that are actually used in practice. Well, let's move on now to the first of several substantial uh, segments of this presentation, talking about heat transfer fundamentals. Now, I want to emphasize that uh, I assume no prior knowledge about heat transfer uh, in general, no less in geostructural systems. So I'm going to start off with some very va basic uh, terms and definitions. Uh, this may be familiar to many of you, but certainly I uh, to make this presentation attractive to the widest possible audience uh, I want to assume that you basically know nothing about heat transfer so we'll start with some very very basic concepts as I said this is a fairly substantial segment I've broken this up into uh, several topics as you see here and let me begin with some background When we talk about heat transfer in geostructural systems, this generally involves the near surface zone of the ground, uh, as well as the lower part of the Earth's atmosphere where it is in contact with the ground. So we're looking at focusing at the interface between the atmosphere and the ground. The effects that happen in the zone of interest to us fall into three broad categories uh, we have steady state problems we have what I call seasonally transient problems and we have diurnally or daily transient problems so if we look now just at a simple depiction this is this line is the gr uh, ground surface so we have the atmosphere and we have the ground if we first look at the steady state conditions for that the atmosphere that is close to the ground surface and for the ground that is close to the atmosphere uh, the temperature in the steady state is the annual average annual air temperature now that is a formal meteorological parameter it is technically measured two meters above the ground surface now in imperial units you'll sometimes see that the official height is five feet which is a little bit less than two meters of course but there is a standard height at which the annual average air temperature is measured and I do want to emphasize note that it is not the ground surface temperature uh, it may surprise you but the ground surface temperature can be quite a bit different than even the temperature a couple of meters several feet above that ground surface so the ground surface temperature during the day can be hotter during the night can be colder uh, because the ground surface temperature really reflects the surface materials very substantially so average annual air temperature is something you could find for countless places around the world this is an official measurement that's made uh, by weather bureaus weather services etc so this information is pretty easy to find on a site-specific basis now another steady state consideration is what we call the geothermal heat flux and this is just the day in day out 
flow of heat coming from the center of the Earth due to natural processes. Now, the magnitude of this heat flux does vary rather substantially. Uh, on a first order basis, it is very different between land masses and water. Uh, this is a fairly reasonable average value for land masses. You will certainly find values above and below this, but this is a, a good average number for discussion purposes and certainly for most civil engineering purposes where you may actually want to model this uh, heat flux. So, I mean, it is fairly nominal or uh, modest. I mean, these are, in the scheme of things, pretty small numbers. But again, keep in mind, this, this is going on 24-7-52. This is uh, ongoing continuously. And of course, some of that heat is going to flow out into the atmosphere. Now, when we move now to what I call seasonally transient, uh, we now have to consider additional things, and this is the specifically the uh, atmospheric source heat, which can increase and decrease during the course uh, of some ex extended period of time of, of several months or uh, certainly that sort of time frame. That's what I mean by seasonally transient. Uh, this would be the typical change between, say, summer and winter in most temperate climates. Now, if we go to a diurnally or daily transient, we now have a day-night heat exchange going on at the ground surface. This is much more complex, as we'll see. And when we get down to looking at daily changes, we have to start to consider things like wind, uh, which are going to affect uh, the temperatures as well. Now, the majority of geostructural applications of interest uh, involve the effect of these natural heat mechanisms on structures that are placed on or in the ground. And note that in this presentation, I use the term structure in a very broad context. It's not just a building. I use the term structure to mean any what I call constructed facility. And this could be a transportation infrastructure, such as a pavement or railway as well as underground conduits and utility lines. So I use the term structure in a very, very broad context here. It's not limited to a building. Now, there are a wide variety of geostructural applications where some constructed facility will itself cause some localized perturbation or change in the balance of these natural heat mechanisms. Uh, and that's especially true if the facility is a long-term source of heat modification. And I'll give you some examples uh, a little bit later as to what I'm talking about. Now, groundwater is another very important phenomenon when it comes to uh, heat transfer, simply because, as we'll see, water, and by the way, when I use the term water in this presentation, I'm typically talking about the liquid phase. Uh, when I mean the solid phase of water, I will use the colloquial term ice. Uh, the vapor phase of water really does not come up very much in geostructural applications, so that's not going to be an issue. But as we'll see, liquid water uh, really can very significantly affect the heat regime in the ground. So groundwater is going to affect uh, the heat transfer in this near surface environment as well. So it's useful to uh, review some basic concepts related to groundwater. Again, here's our ground surface if we have a groundwater table. And as a first order, that divides into the saturated zone below the groundwater table. Groundwater table, as we know, in Geotechnical engineering is where the water pressure is exactly zero. It is not where the soil is wet. We'll see that in a second. And between the groundwater table and the ground surface, we have the Vado zone. Now, groundwater flow is very important. All groundwater flows. Um, very often in geotechnical engineering, if we're looking at a site with a fairly limited horizontal extent, we'll assume that the groundwater table is flat 
we ignore the groundwater flow. And that's a reasonable approximation for a very limited a site, a very limited area. But as a general rule, of course, groundwater is always flowing. Every place on Earth, groundwater is always flowing from some higher elevation to some body of water in general. Uh, there are also temporal variations in the groundwater table. We tend to forget this far too often in geotechnical engineering and foundation engineering that the groundwater table for any number of natural and human reasons, human induced reasons, uh, can vary uh, sometimes very substantially just in the course of a year or certainly over periods of years, things like that. We also have precipitation plus water from human activity entering the ground uh, or impacting the ground surface and certainly some of that will infiltrate into the ground. We have evapotranspiration from the ground surface and vegetation on the ground surface. And wind plays a role here as well, especially in terms of moving evapotranspiration, uh, the vapor phase of water around. However, the most important thing about the groundwater system is the naturally occurring upward flow of water within the Vado zone. Now, this is something that is typically ignored in most geostructural applications, uh, but it plays a very, very significant role in heat transfer problems, uh, as we'll see later on, so we need to cover this in some detail. Uh, what I'm talking about is that this simple Vado saturated zone model that we're used to seeing in geotechnical engineering, uh, there is always a capillary rise. And that produces what is called the capillary fringe. Now, the, the height of capillary rise can be anywhere from a fraction of an inch, a few millimeters, to several feet or meters. Uh, really depends on the particle size distribution of the soil. And this is a very important uh, phenomenon that we know about nowadays from partially saturated soil mechanics. And this capillary fringe is actually saturated. So the Vado zone really has an unsaturated and saturated zone. Uh, that's why I said earlier that one should never interpret wet soil as being the groundwater table. You can have saturated soil that extends feet or meters above the true groundwater table. Again, the true groundwater table is where the water pressure is exactly equal to zero, the static water pressure U0. So wet soil per se, saturated soil even, does not mean uh, that one has encountered the groundwater table. And then again, from partially saturated soil mechanics, we know that we can have unsaturated flow that comes up from this capillary fringe. And to illustrate what goes on in a generic uh, qualitative sense, if we plot the degree of saturation uh, in the ground as a function of depth, of course it's 100% saturated below the groundwater table, saturated within the capillary fringe, and usually within the unsaturated portion of the Vado zone, uh, you'll see some distribution that would uh, look typically like this in a qualitative sense. And now this is subject always to quite a bit of temporal variation. I mean, for example, if it rains and you have infiltration in the ground, you're gonna see this curve will shoot up to 100% saturated right at the ground surface then drop back down and then increase again. So you could get some very complex variations. And this is a very dynamic, ever-changing sort of uh, environment. Moving on to an overview of heat transfer fundamentals. Uh, in addition to and separate from the actual physical interaction between heat and water in the near surface environment, uh, the mechanics of seepage of groundwater through saturated soil is actually a useful uh, qualitative tool. Uh, 
uh, plays a very useful role in the learning process for heat transfer through a solid material and by extension a quasi-solid such as soil. So again, appreciating that at least some of you viewers uh, will not be very familiar with heat transfer, uh, I will use quite, uh, quite extensively from here on out uh, the very familiar concepts to you, uh, the concepts of groundwater seepage through saturated soil. I will use those concepts to illustrate concepts in heat transfer. Uh, at least conductive heat transfer. It's a very useful teaching uh, uh, educational mechanism and learning mechanism. And the reason we could do this is because heat is conceptually analogous to water. And again, when I say water, I mean liquid water. And the flow or movement of heat through a solid material, uh, through conduction, is conceptually and theoretically, as we'll see, analogous to the flow of groundwater under saturated conditions. And I'm sure that each of you viewing this uh, presentation, uh, this is a topic you know well, uh, because the flow of groundwater through saturated conditions is taught to all seven civil engineers on, in undergraduate soil mechanics. Interestingly enough, we'll see the same basic mathematical equation governs both heat and groundwater flow, and there are co corresponding material parameters. Uh, we can use flow nets, which is the classical graphical depiction of groundwater seepage to illustrate heat flow. So I, I, as I said, I'm going to use analogies with groundwater throughout the remainder of this presentation to help define and explain basic heat transfer parameters and concepts, uh, at least conductive heat transfer concepts. I will note in passing that another useful analogy for heat transfer is the flow of electricity through a wire. I'll give some examples using the electricity flow, but most of my analogies will be with groundwater flow. Well, let's begin with some definitions. As I said earlier, I presume no knowledge about heat transfer, uh, conductive heat transfer, so we'll start with the basics. Heat, of course, the most basic. Uh, it's a fundamental physical qual uh, quantity uh, of heat transfer is heat. Heat is invisible, though indirectly measurable. Uh, heat is a form of energy and therefore has the ability to do work. Uh, heat is movable and can flow in or out of a system. Uh, note that in the science of heat transfer, uh, the term cold is only a colloquial descriptive non-technical term. There is no such physical quantity or parameter as cold. Uh, so an object gets colder, if you will, when heat is removed and it gets hotter when heat is added. So again, heat is the only quantity, the physical quantity uh, we're talking about here. Heat is either removed or added to a system. Of course, the corresponding physical qu uh, quantity in groundwater seepage is the water itself. The next term is temperature. I use capital T as the notation. Temperature is the metric for the uh, indirect visualization and measurement of heat. As we'll see, temperature is the parameter that appears in algebraic equations governing heat transfer. So temperature is the theoretical stand-in in, in governing equations. Uh, the corresponding metric and parameter in groundwater seepage is the total head of water, capital H. Now in imperial units, temperature is expressed in degrees Fahrenheit. In SI, uh, it's expressed either in degrees Celsius when it is used as a standalone unit, or Kelvin when used in conjunction with other units. So actually most of the SI definitions you'll see will use the term Kelvin. Note that when you use the term Kelvin, you uh, do not use degrees or the mathematical symbol for degrees. All right, Kelvin is implied to be uh, in degrees. Now in groundwater seepage, total head is typically expressed using un length units commonly feet or meters, 
The next uh, quantity to define is heat transfer. So using these basic terms, heat transfer can be formally defined as the flow of heat, uh, as defined by some quantity, uh, some imaginary volume, if you will, of heat. Uh, and heat transfer, heat flow, is always caused by a temperature differential between two points. So this corresponds to groundwater flow, as defined by some volume of water, that is caused by a total head differential between two points. As with groundwater flow, heat always goes uh, from the higher temperature to lower temperature, in the same way that water flows from the higher total head to the lower total head. In imperial units, the quantity of heat is expressed using British thermal units, or BTUs. Now, BTU is obviously not an intuitive unit. So, uh, B one BTU is the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of water, which is approximately one pint in volume, by one degree Fahrenheit under sea level atmospheric conditions. Uh, there is an imperial unit, another imperial unit for heat calories. Uh, that is deprecated in heat transfer applications. So um, you will see uh, in some older textbooks, you will see uh, the use of calorie as an imperial unit, but I'm only going to use BTUs. Now in SI units, the quantity of heat is expressed using joules. And again, for comparison in groundwater seepage, Either we use a length-based unit like cubic feet or cubic meters, or we use a special volume unit, uh, gallons or liters. The next parameter is heat flux, capital Q. Heat flux is the time rate of heat transfer, so it's the heat flow rate. So when someone talks about heat flux, they're talking about the heat flow rate. And the corresponding physical quantity in groundwater seepage is the seepage rate. Generally, we use lowercase q as the notation. Now, in imperial units, heat flux is expressed in BTUs per unit time. And there is not a particular time unit that is predominant. Uh, it varies by application. So it could be you know, seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, years, as fits the particular application. I will notice as an aside, simply because I'm sure many of you, at least here in the United States, have heard this term. Uh, when you hear people talk about uh, air conditioning or refrigeration systems, you'll very frequently see uh, refrigeration or air conditioning units sized in terms of tons. Uh, when the, the unit of ton is used in a heat flux uh, context, one ton is equal to 12,000 BTUs per hour. So we, we don't use this in civil engineering, but I just noted, note this in passing uh, because I'm sure many of you have heard this term. Uh, in SI units, heat flux is expressed using watts, where one watt is defined as one joule per second. Uh, you'll see the SI unit of milliwatt very commonly used in heat flux problems. That's, that's quite a common unit. If you look back a few slides, you'll see, for example, the, the geothermal heat flux was expressed in milliwatts. And again, in groundwater seepage, seeper rate is typically expressed either using length based units like cubic feet per unit time or cubic meters per unit time, or using volume units, gallons per unit time, liters per unit time. And again, in groundwater flow, uh, there's no particular time unit that predominates. Uh, it, it varies by the application. So you could have you know, gallons per minute, hour, day, or whatever, uh, depending on the application. Let's next talk about heat transfer mechanisms. Unlike groundwater, uh, where a molecule of water can only flow through the voids in soil or discontinuous in bedrock, uh, and of course I'm, I'm, I'm removing for simplicity bedrock 
like a sandstone that has an intrinsic permeability. Uh, heat, can all, uh, heat can flow with three different physical mechanisms, depending on the flow medium. So using this simple uh, cartoon, if you will, of a pot of uh, boiling water over an open flame, we see that heat can be transmitted. Heat flux can occur either as radiation through a gas, in this case, radiation through the air. It can occur as convection within a liquid, so we have convection within the boiling water, for example, and we can have conduction. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people say direct conduction. That's really redundant. Uh, you have conduction through a solid and by extension a quasi-solid such as soil. So there are three distinct heat transmission mechanisms, uh, and each of these has distinct uh, material properties used to find using different parameters. So the most general case of heat flux can actually get quite complicated because you have to, in, th in principle, consider all three mechanisms, and each one has unique parameters and units associated with it. Now, the interesting thing is that although soil is really, in general, what we call the three-phase medium, I mean, we have solid particles, we can have liquid, groundwater, we can have uh, poor vapor, poor gas. As I said earlier, we found that heat transfer through the soil can be treated as a quasi-solid. So very fortunately for us, uh, in geostructural systems, we only need to consider the mechanism of conduction when we're looking at heat flow through soil and rock. Uh, unfortunately, conditions at the ground surface are much more complex because the heat transfer between the atmosphere and ground, you can get radiative and convective mechanisms uh, as well. And just to give you some indication, I had previously shown you this on an earlier slide in a very simplistic fashion, the heat transfer between ground and atmosphere. In reality, it's quite complicated. Uh, there are several uh, long and short wave radiative uh, mechanisms. There's con convective mechanisms. So this very simple transfer of heat between atmosphere and ground is actually, if you wanted to model it uh, analytically, would be quite complex because there are many distinct mechanisms involving both radiation and convection that have to be considered. Although here on the ground, you only have to consider conduction. So what are the material properties that go with uh, the mechanism of conduction? Heat transfer in a solid uh, it, mode of conduction is governed by two fundamental material properties. One is called thermal conductivity, and that relates to the time rate at which heat can flow through a material. And the reciprocal of this is thermal resistivity, but we, we normally work with conductivity in civil engineering applications. Heat capacity relates to the ability of the material through which the heat is flowing to retain or store heat. In other words, to act as a heat sink. Uh, now there's a related parameter to heat capacity called latent heat. Uh, and this has to do with the phase change of a material between solid liquid and liquid and vapor or gas phase. So in simplest terms, heat transfer through a solid or quasi-solid like soil via the mechanism of conduction is a function of two things. One, how quickly the material allows the heat to flow. That's related to thermal conductivity. This is analogous to fluid permeability of soil or electrical conductivity of a wire. And the second issue we always need to consider is how much heat is related to temperature change of the material as heat is flowing through it. This is the heat capacity part. This is analogous to head loss through friction that occurs when water flows through soil or the voltage drop that occurs due to electrical resistance and heating of a wire as electricity flows through it. 
So moving on to an overview of conductive material properties. There are three broad categories of materials that we typically deal with in geostructural applications uh, involving heat transfer. We have what I call true solids, and these are typically structural materials such as Portland cement concrete, asphalt concrete, steel, wood. Uh, and we also have synthetic thermal insulation. So these are what we call, I call true solids. We have soil that is a quasi-solid from a heat transfer perspective. And rock as it occurs as bedrock is, can be an ill-defined material from a heat transfer perspective. And we'll see why in a minute. Well, each of these three material categories requires a different approach for evaluating thermal material properties. Fortunately, true solids typically have more or less constant values of thermal material properties, conductivity and, and uh, heat capacity, uh, with the exception of synthetic thermal insulated materials that are placed on or in the ground. And in fact, I, I will if you look at the outline of this presentation, I'll, I devote a section to synthetic thermal insulated materials at the very end of the presentation. Uh, that's because of the, the rather unique niche that they occupy. Uh, the thermal material properties of soil vary the most by far as a function of soil type. Uh, really, when I say soil type, I'm talking here about particle size and particle type. That is, are we talking about granular particles like sand, or are we talking about clay minerals? Water content and temperature, but really temperature as it affects the phase change of poor water between liquid and ice. As I said earlier, rock can be difficult to deal with because although it is a true solid, when we encounter a rock in the ground as bedrock, it is almost always fractured by discontinuities. And as we know, these discontinuities can contain groundwater. Uh, even above the groundwater table, uh, very often the rock is at least partially saturated or the discontinuities are partially saturated. And this creates a problem because the water can significantly alter the thermal material properties of the overall bedrock mass. So a fair warning, uh, if you look in textbooks or reference manuals, things like that, be very, very careful of uh, thermal material properties that you'll often see for rock because these, these properties are typically for specimens of dry rock which are behave as true solids. Uh, once the rock is in the ground as bedrock and we get discontinuities, it can have very, very different material properties due to the presence of even a relatively small amount of water. So one has to be very careful when modeling a system that involves bedrock and how you treat the, uh, the water content of that rock. Well, now let's get specific about the material properties, starting out with thermal conductivity. Thermal conductivity relates to, if you will, the velocity which heat flows through a solid material, the heat flux, and thus how rapidly a temperature uh, material within that material can change. Thermal conductivity, as I've said earlier, is analogous to the permeability of soil with respect to groundwater seepage or the electrical conductivity of a metal wire. It's important to understand that as with soil or permeability of soil or conductivity of wire, thermal conductivity reflects a potential for heat flux. The actual rate at which heat flux occurs depends on the temperature differential or gradient that is driving the heat flux in the same way that seepage velocity depends on head difference or gradient. Right? We know, for example, Darcy's law for laminar flow of water through a saturated soil, uh, the velocity is equal to the coefficient of permeability times the gradient. If you have a zero gradient, it doesn't matter what the coefficient of permeability is, you're not going to get a flow velocity. And the same thing is true of heat 
So the material property related to thermal conductivity is the coefficient of thermal conductivity. Generally, we use lowercase k. Uh, the typical units in geostructural applications for the coefficient of thermal conductivity. Uh, this rather complicated set of imperial units is quite typical. Uh, SI units are a little bit simpler, watts per meter Kelvin. And I just expand on this using, of course, watt being a joule second. Uh, to help visualize what these dimensions are about, heat flux is so many BTUs per hour or watts, which is a joule per second, through a unit area, square foot or square meter of material, per unit temperature gradient, one degree Fahrenheit per inch or one Kelvin per meter. So that helps you understand the somewhat non-intuitive units that you see here. In simple terms, the smaller the value of the coefficient of thermal conductivity K, the slower the heat flux through the material for a given gradient. And therefore, the more efficient it is as a thermal insulator. So if, if you're looking for synthetic thermal insulation, you, you want to look for the material with the lowest K value, if you will. Now, in most geostructural applications, it is reasonable to assume that the coefficient of thermal conductivity is isotropic. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Same way as in fluid seepage through the ground, the permeability can be isotro anisotropic. Uh, but in heat transfer problems and uh, geostructural applications, uh, we almost always assume that thermal conductivity is isotropic. And again, for true solids, we assume the value is constant. Uh, soil is much more complex as the coefficient of thermal conductivity depends on soil type, soil unit weight or density, water content, and whether the soil is frozen or not. A wide variety of laboratory field and empirical methods to evaluate the conductivity of soil. Uh, sufficient, I found, for many geostructural applications, certainly even in this day and age, uh, preliminary calculations. Uh, Kirsten, back in 1949, did some outstanding work and published a research report. Uh, and from that, extracted empirical formulas uh, based on imperial units. And these formulas can be found in many reference documents. Now, the reciprocal of the coefficient of thermal conductivity is the th coefficient of thermal resistivity. And at least in the United States, it is called the R value. So this should be familiar to anyone who's ever shopped for thermal insulation for a house or something like that. Uh, products are typically sold and marketed based on their R value. So R value is a, a metric for the uh, how efficient the material product is as thermal insulation. Now, R values, at least in the United States, are expressed either as a dimensionless number for a given product or as a dimensionless number per inch, thick, inch thickness of a given material. And the larger the R value, the better in either case. Again, if, um, a thermal insulation perspective. Uh, it may surprise you to understand that R actually has not only dimensions, but a very specific set of imperial units. So if you see a product that says the R value of this product is such and such, in reality, here are the dimensions and the imperial units that go along with it. And similarly, if you see a material, they say the R value is so much per inch of material, Here's the appropriate dimension and units that go along with it as well. So knowing this, it, it's very easy. If you know the R value of some product or material, uh, you simply take the reciprocal of that, and that will be the coefficient of thermal conductivity. But do be careful of the units.
Okay, let's next talk about heat capacity. Again, heat capacity is a metric for the heat storage capability of a solid material, and it's expressed on either a volumetric or mass weight basis. Heat capacity is analogous to the head loss that occurs during groundwater seepage or voltage drop that occurs as electricity flows through wire, but with a very important difference, and that is because heat capacity is reversible. So heat can either be added to or removed from a solid material, depending on the initial temperature of that material. And heat capacity is an infinitely reversible process. You, you can't wear out the heat capacity of a solid material. Now, as with thermal conductivity, heat capacity is a potential quantity. So you have to activate it, if you will, by an actual heat flux in the same way that you have to have actual groundwater seepage in order for head loss to occur or an actual electrical current through a wire in order for there to be a voltage drop through that wire. The material property for heat capacity is either the volumetric heat capacity, lowercase c sub v, or mass heat capacity, lowercase c sub n. M, again, depending on whether a volumetric or mass weight formulation is being used in a given application. Uh, the typical units in geostructural applications for volumetric heat capacity are, are quite intuitive, uh, BTU per cubic foot degree Fahrenheit or joule meter cube Kelvin. So to visualize this, this is the quantity of heat, either BTU or joules, that must be added or removed from a unit volume of material in order to raise or lower the temperature by one degree Fahrenheit or one Kelvin. And the larger the value of volumetric heat capacity, the greater the heat retention capability of that material. Uh, moving on to mass heat capacity, you see the typical units in geostructural applications, very similar except obviously uh, weight and mass replaced for volume. All right, so this is the quantity of heat to be added or removed from one pound or one kilogram of material in order to change the temperature of that material. And again, the larger the value, the more the heat retention capability. Now for true solids, it's reasonable to assume that either the volumetric or mass heat capacity is constant. Uh, for soil, it's much more complex because it depends on the soil unit weight or density, water content especially, and whether or not the soil is frozen. Uh, water content and the phase of that water, is that liquid versus solid, are particularly important as if we look at all the materials that we routinely encounter in geostructural applications, you know, uh, steel, concrete, wood, uh, asphalt, uh, if we look at all the materials we encounter, uh, liquid water has the largest value of heat capacity by far. Uh, you know, I, the old adage, uh, watching water never boils. Uh, you know that if you put a pot of water on a stove, it, it takes quite a bit of heat to make it boil. And that's a reflection of the relatively significant heat capacity of water. Uh, and that's why you have to be very careful in geostructural applications. You really need to have a very accurate idea of the water content of soil when you're talking about the heat capacity because that's really going to dictate the uh, parameter. So as I said the presence or the relative quantity, either volume or mass of water, tends to really dominate geostructural heat transfer problems. And again, with, bed, with rock as bedrock, you have to be very careful because if there's water in the voids or the discontinuities of that rock, uh, it's really going to change the heat capacity of that rock mass significantly.
Uh, there's a variety of methods for evaluating heat capacity. Sufficient, I found, for many geostructural applications. There are, there are theoretical formulas that can be found in many references. And they typically involve the uh, dry unit weight or density of the soil, the water content, and whether or not the soil is frozen. The nice thing about, because these are theoretical formulas, they could be used with any consistent set of units. Uh, I do want to give you a heads up. I, I have found, uh, as I told you at the very beginning of this presentation, uh, my knowledge about heat transfer is entirely self-taught. Uh, I got involved in some consulting work in 1980 and really had to do a crash self-study course in heat transfer in the ground. And, uh, you know, bought a bunch of textbooks. Most of the textbooks I got at the time were in various aspects of frozen ground and Arctic engineering, uh, cold regions engineering. And very surprised by how sloppy so many of these books are. And, and they were all written by academicians for the most part, but very sloppy with terminology and notation with respect to the heat capacity parameter. Uh, very often they just use C. They didn't put a subscript V or M. So the only way to tell what the author was talking about was to look at the units. Uh, when all else fails, look at the units for heat capacity, and that will tell you whether it's the volumetric or uh, weight mass formulation. Now, there's a, a thermal material property that in most books you will see presented and treated as a distinct material property. But it really is conceptually a, uh, a part of heat capacity. And this is the parameter of latent heat effusion. Uh, sometimes you'll hear it called enthalpy effusion or simply heat effusion. Latent heat effusion is conceptually related to the latent heat of vaporization or enthalpy of vaporization. In both cases, latent heat is the one-time quantity of heat either BTUs or joules, that is either added or removed from a system in order to cause a material phase change. So I like to think of latent heat as basically being a slug, if you will, of heat capacity that is related to a phase change. And in geostructural application, the phase change is gonna to tend to be between liquid water and ice, one way or the other. So typically, latent heat effusion in, in the ground is, uh, applies to the groundwater. In this case, latent heat is the quantity of heat that must be added to ice in order to melt it or thaw it, or the quantity of heat that must be removed from liquid water in order to freeze it. Note that in principle, this phase change between water and ice occurs at a single temperature, plus 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius, at least at atmospheric pressure. Uh, however, as we'll see, for a variety of reasons, this phase change actually occurs over a range in temperature for water in the ground. And what that range in temperature is, is very much dependent on soil type, particle size. Uh, the finer the soil, the larger the range in temperature. As with heat capacity, latent heat effusion can be expressed on either a volumetric basis or a mass basis. Uh, typical units uh, for volumetric heat effusion, L sub V, are BTUs per cubic foot, joules per cubic meter. And of course, the, this is simply the quantity of heat that must be added or removed from a unit volume of material in order to thaw ice or freeze water. And the larger the value, the greater the quantity of heat involved in the phase change. If we go to a mass formulation for latent heat effusion, uh, here are the units. And again, this is simply the quantity of heat that must be added to a pound or kilogram of material in order to cause the phase change one way or the other. <clears throat> 
again, the larger the value, the greater the quantity of heat involved in the phase change. I've always found that sufficient for many geostructural applications, there are theoretical formulas uh, for both the volumetric and mass formulations uh, usable with any consistent set of units, and you can find these in many references. Again, not surprisingly, the relative volume or mass of water involved significantly influences these calculated values. And this is due directly to the very significant heat capacity of both water and ice. Uh, ice has about half the heat capacity of water, um, but it is still very, very significant. So uh, again, when you're looking at uh, any heat capacity related parameter in geostructural applications, it's really the water content of the earth materials that is, is going to drive the problem. Uh, you need to make sure you have a very good handle on the water contents of soil and rock uh, that may be involved. The final property I want to mention is called thermal diffusivity. Uh, some books you'll see it called thermal inertia and it is not a fundamental material property but a derived parameter. Uh, that is based primarily on fundamental thermal material properties of both heat uh, conductivity and heat capacity. Uh, and the reason for defining thermal diffu diffusivity, we'll see a little bit later, it, it really is a very convenient way of bundling together uh, both the thermal conductivity and the heat capacity of a solid material. The coefficient of thermal diffusivity alpha Slightly defin definitions depending on the system of units. Uh, this is the definition for imperial units. And here you see the coefficient of thermal conductivity, the mass heat capacity, and the total unit weight of the material. In SI, we use the total density of the material. And here you see the resulting units. Uh, interesting thing is to notice that this parameter has the same dimensions, same kind of odd dimensions, length squared per time, as the coefficient of consolidation in soil mechanics. Uh, so we could use that similarity for, our, for kind of visualizing what thermal diffusivity is all about. As we know, for the coefficient of consolidation, the larger the value, the faster consolidation progresses. Well, for the coefficient of thermal diffusivity, the larger the value, the faster heat flows through the material. For the coefficient of consolidation, we know that the time rate of consolidation is dependent on not only on the permeability of the soil, but the stiffness of the soil skeleton. And for the coefficient of thermal diffusivity, the heat flux, the time rate of heat flow, is dependent not only on the thermal conductivity, but the mass heat capacity as well. This now brings us to uh, the most theoretical segment of this pr presentation, and that is the modeling of conductive heat transfer. And again, this is a fairly lengthy segment that I've broken up into several topics. Uh, and I'm going to conclude with uh, practical observations. So we'll start off with quite a bit of theoretical discussion, but we will end up with my personal firsthand observations from using, doing these sorts of analyses over the last 40 plus years. Well, let's start off with mathematical models. Rather interestingly, uh, you know, as I'm sure everyone knows, in groundwater seepage, most of the problems we deal with in practice are steady state problems. Uh, so, for example, when you're teaching or learning undergraduate soil mechanics, uh, you, you learn, you teach uh, steady state flow. However, in geostructural heat transfer problems, 
uh, the vast majority of cases are transient conditions. So we need to start off with a discussion of mathematical models for transient conditions. Uh, the formulation of the general three-dimensional model for transient conductive heat flux in a solid material is slightly different depending on the system of units. When we use four space and pure units, uh, we get this partial differential equation. As you can see, it involves the coefficient of thermal conductivity, which I'm leaving quite general here to be anisotropic. Uh, notice that the primary parameter is temperature on both sides of the equation. As I told you earlier, temperature is the metric or stand-in for heat, which is a, a quantity we can't see. I'll define this parameter Q in a second. This is the total unit weight of the material, mass heat capacity. So when we use mass-based SI units, all that differs is instead of using total unit weight, we're using total density. Uh, lowercase t here is, of course, time. This capital Q parameter in this case is what is called the internal heat generation parameter. And this allows for the most general case where the material through which heat is moving is actually generating heat on its own. Uh, this is comes up rarely in practice where this has certainly come up in an actual application has been with nuclear waste isolation. We're looking to bury radioactive waste that is generating heat and will be generating heat for thousands of years. So you, you have to take into account the internal heat generation of the material itself. Uh, these are the dimensions of this internal heat generation parameter Q, BTU per cubic foot, whatever time unit you want, and SI units, joules per cubic meter per time unit. Well, if we assume isotropic conductivity, uh, which is, we do all the time usually, the equation simplifies to this. And, and you can see where thermal diffusivity parameter comes in handy. It allows us to consolidate a bunch of terms together efficiently. Uh, and this is independent of the system of units because the system of units is built into the alpha parameter. Now, in, in most ordinary geostructural applications, this internal heat generation parameter is going to be zero. So this equation simplifies further. And this is the transient solution that is generally used in practice. If we go one step further and develop the steady state solution, so there is no temporal variation in temperatures throughout the material, only spatial, we get this equation, which should look very familiar to you because this is the well-known Laplace equation. And rather amazingly, Laplace equation uh, uh, defines several very different, completely unrelated physical phenomena. I mean, uh, there are things in civil engineering, there are things in electrical engineering and physics uh, that are defined by the Laplace equation. And the most common time we as civil engineers see this is this defines the steady state steepage of groundwater. So what that means is flow nets, and I remember from my years in academic instruction, flow nets was always one of those topics that students love to hate. Uh, flow nets are very useful graphical solution to Laplace equation, uh, widely used to draw flow nets and groundwater seepage. And we could do this for heat flux as well. Now in this case, the streamlines in the flow net are the paths of heat flux. And the equipotential lines in the flow net are the lines of comp constant temperature. And this is just a simple example uh, that I found of showing the heat flow from within a building that is uh, artificially heated to the outside, uh, cold winter day. And the black curves are the streamlines depicting the flow paths of heat, the heat flux that is going from
hot to cold, so going in this direction. And here, the equipotential lines have been color-coded to indicate lines of constant temperature. Let's talk next about computational tools. How do we go about solving these equations? The tools that have been widely available and used uh, for several decades now fall into three broad categories. Number one, we have closed form solutions for steady state conditions. And some of the oldest ones I found were published in an international uh, conference paper by Ruck, uh, two, two papers actually by Ruckley back in 1948. Uh, they predate digital computers, very easy to solve manually. Uh, obviously, they only work for relatively simple problems and problem geometries, but they do have the benefit of being usable for synthetic thermal insulation. Perhaps the most common tool is the second one, uh, which is simplified method for one-dimensional transient analysis. A very classical problem in conductive heat transfer is called the modified Bergeron equation. And this solves a problem in time-dependent one-dimensional movement of a freezing front through a multi-layered system. And usually it's aligned vertically, but it doesn't have to be, but usually you see it aligned vertically. So for, if you will, frost penetration in the ground. Uh, you can use it in the reverse for a thawing analysis as well. Uh, the equation is solvable by manual calculation. Uh, it was developed prior to the widespread availability of digital computers. Nowadays, as a minimum, you find people will use a spreadsheet to solve it. You can actually find purpose-written software that has been uh, developed by government agencies for this. this. This is probably our most popular tool. I'm going to talk about this quite a bit. The reason this is the most popular tool is very well suited for analyses of seasonal ground freezing. And I would have to say that the single most common conductive heat transfer problem and geostructural application is seasonal ground freezing. Uh, this has been of interest since the 1950s, 1960s, uh, by both the US military and state departments of transportation for evaluating uh, the progression of ground freezing beneath pavements, whether airfield pavements or highway pavements, whatever. So while you may find the modified Bergeron equation in many books and design manuals, what you will not find, unfortunately, is a very detailed list of its simplifications and assumptions that were built into its derivation. I, I've had to learn the hard way from my self-teaching of the extreme limitations and simplifications in the modified Bergeron equation. So I'm going to talk about these in some detail because it's very important that you understand all the approximations that are built into this uh, very simple tool. Uh, the most the biggest problem is that the equation significantly underestimates the benefit of using synthetic thermal insulation. Uh, last but not least, we have the numerical solution using the finite element method. Now, the earliest finite element uh, program that I found was written by Dr. Ronald Polivka as his doctoral work at UC Berkeley. And it was well documented in a research report by Plivka and Wilson uh, back in 1976. Uh, it was one of the first finite element programs going back to the 1970s when, uh, and I realize that for most of you uh, nowadays, it's hard to imagine a time with we didn't have digital computers in civil engineering. But certainly in the 1970s, um, Digital computers were still a novelty, at least for practicing engineers, uh, because they were still mainframe computers, with punch card input, so you know you had to go out of your way to to use one. Uh, Professor Edward, Professor Emeritus Edward Wilson is uh, 
really one of the early pioneers of applying the finite element method to structural engineering and structural mechanics. In fact, by sheer coincidence, the very, very first finite element program I ever played around with as an undergraduate uh, back around 1970 uh, at Columbia University uh, was a program that Ed Wilson had written, or more likely it was one of his doctoral students had written, uh, just a very simple program for uh, applying the equations of linear elasticity to a, a solid. Um, I, Polivka's pro, uh, program, since it's been around so long, uh, the original program was called DOT, Determination Temperature. It was used for the design of the Alyeska pipeline, as well as for nuclear waste isolation studies in the western U.S. in the latter decades of the 20th century. That's how I, I became familiar with it. I uh, worked with some people uh, in 1980 who had we're just finishing working on the Alyeska pipeline. Uh, I used the derivative version of DOT beginning in 1987. At that time, was uh, on a was called a mini computer or VAC system. And uh, since the 1990s, I've used a microcomputer version where I've actually tinkered with the Fortran coding a little bit. Uh, and I've used that program for both project work and research. So I, I've, I've used the, the, the DOT program extensively uh, over the years. Uh, as a minimum, they provide a much better assessment of one-dimensional problems compared to the modified Bergman equation, and certainly can also do two-dimensional and axisymmetric or circular symmetric problem geometries. Well, nowadays, of course, uh, this is all ancient history. Uh, there's many commercially available finite element codes for geotechnical and structural engineering to have the capability for thermal analyses. And more and more, this software is capable of handling true three-dimensional pro problems. But the main thing I want you to appreciate is that uh, we've had fairly relatively advanced tools for doing heat transfer analyses in solids uh, for what, about 45 years now, so uh, quite a long time. I should note, just for the sake of completeness, that from time to time, you will see in the literature attempts by various research groups, uh, especially the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Cold War Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory in New Hampshire. Uh, you'll see people develop advanced simple models, for lack of a better term. And they strive to be something more accurate than the modified Bergman equation, which has a lot of issues with it, uh, but less complicated than a full-blown finite element analysis. I'm not going to talk about any of these because they really uh, have not seen any widespread recognition of use in practice. So I, I'm not going to get into any of these further in this presentation. I next want to talk about boundary conditions. As I indicated earlier, in conductive heat transfer uh, in a solid material is a classic boundary value problem, but the boundaries are much more complex than we typically find in a geostructural boundary value problem. This is because one of the two boundaries, the lower one, as we'll see, is always ill-defined and, and thus totally subjective. And each of the two boundary conditions is temporally dynamic or variable. It's not static. So each of the boundary conditions is variable, varying in time. Because these boundaries are varying in time, they can create effects within the ground away from the boundaries. So uh, all in all, the boundary conditions are much bigger consideration in heat transfer problems than in your typical boundary value problem. The two boundary conditions that always need to be considered are the ground at some depth that is the artificial base of the problem and the atmosphere ground interface. 
Now, I had said earlier that as a starting point, uh, the relatively shallow ground and how shallow is shallow does vary. The relatively shallow ground on average has an average annual, uh, is at a temperature of the average annual air temperature for the site. But there are significant variations and deviations from this. To begin with, as we've mentioned previously, we have the geothermal heat flux, which means if you go deep enough below the ground surface, you begin to feel the effects of that. And uh, there is a nominally linear increase in temperature with depth below a certain depth. Now, what that certain depth is, is not fixed. It does vary. Although for most geostructural applications, this transition is well below uh, the problem that you're considering. Uh, these are very typical geothermal gradients that you find in literature. You will find some variation from this. But typically, the effects of this increase uh, only need to be considered if you were looking at relatively like a deep mine or something like that. Uh, then this becomes important. However, much more significant is the fact that uh, we have this very complex heat exchange going on in the atmosphere. So we have the, the Earth sending out heat. We have the atmosphere sending in heat. And as a result, you're going to get a seasonal variation. Now, the of course, the magnitude of that seasonal variation is going to depend on the particular site. It's going to be greater in a colder climate than in a warmer climate. And the depth of that seasonal variation is uh, going to vary substantially. Uh, these are typical ranges that one finds in literature. Uh, a large range, and to a very significant extent, this depth of seasonal variation is influenced by the depths of groundwater. And we can understand that now, understanding that water, liquid water, uh, has a tremendous heat capacity. So water tends to really hold on to heat and moderate heat. So that will, if, if groundwater is shallow, this depth of seasonal variation in temperature is going to be shallow as well. And, and the variation does tend to be nominally exponential, as I've shown here. Uh, you find, of course, great variation on the ground surface, and that decays rapidly with depth. Now, how much of a temperature or range you'll get on the ground surface depends tremendously on what is covering the ground surface. For example, you'll get a much larger variation if you have an asphalt pavement compared to uh, grass or some type of vegetation. Now, in addition to that, because of the day-night heat exchange, uh, which of course is going to be affected by wind, you're going to get a daily or diurnal variation. Now this tends to be fairly shallow, uh, typically a meter or less. So the diurnal variation uh, tends to be very shallow, but again, uh, can be significant depending on what's covering the ground surface. And if you're looking at a relatively shallow utility line, of course, this diurnal variation might be important to you as well. So the point I'm getting at here is, is that both the lower boundary and the upper boundary will cause temperature variations within the ground just in and of themselves. Now, how accurately one needs to model these boundaries depends on the time frame of interest. And of course, it's going to be influenced by the modeling capabilities of the specific computational tool that is being used. As a rule of thumb, the shorter the time frame being analyzed, the more exactly the boundary conditions need to be modeled. And I think you could see that intuitively that you know, if you're looking at what happens during the course of the day, then, of course, the diurnal variations are important. If you're looking at what happens over the course of 50 years, the diurnal variations are irrelevant. On the other hand, 
the simpler the computational tool, the less exactly the boundary conditions can be modeled. So you're going to be constrained there. As a result, there is always a trade-off between computational accuracy and computational tool. And nowadays, since we have ex uh, very exact computational tools available to us in terms of the fine element method, how fancy you need to get with your computational tools can be dictated by how exactly the boundary conditions need to be modeled to give you reasonably accurate results for a given application. I next want to talk about what is called freezing front modeling. Uh, many, most uh, geostructural heat transfer problems involve freezing on the ground and sometimes we look at the thawing as well. Uh, so the freezing and thawing adds another layer of complexity that is similar to the boundary conditions in that reality is much more complex than you might think. So there's a lot of choice that goes into how the freezing front is being modeled. And again, no surprise, how accurately you model the freezing front uh, and its reverse, the thawing front, uh, dictates the computational tool that is used. Conversely, the computational tool will dictate how accurately freezing and thawing can be modeled. So we have the same interaction, subjective interaction between for, uh, uh, computational tool and how accurately to model the freezing front that we had with boundary conditions. The freezing front is called, in many publications, is called the freeze front. Uh, the preferred term nowadays seems to be freezing front, and that's the one I'll use in this presentation. Although I will be honest, if you look at some of my older publications, you'll see me call it the freeze front. Uh, the freezing front, in simple terms, is the demarcation between the frozen and unfrozen ground. Now, of course, we're all taught at a young age that water freezes at plus 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius. And typically, civil engineers will apply this simplistic knowledge when they perform a conductive heat transfer analysis that involves the ground. So this implies that the transition between the frozen and unfrozen ground is abrupt. It's it, either the ground is frozen or unfrozen, nothing in between. It's an abrupt transition. And therefore, if you were depicting this pictorially, you would show it as a uh, line in the ground. Well, reality turns out to be much more complex than this. For a variety of physical reasons I won't get into, they're discussed in textbooks, things like that, the water in the ground does not instantaneously freeze at a single temperature. Uh, freezing occurs over a range in temperatures, and that range is not fixed. The range in temperatures over which water in the ground freezes, or thaws for that matter, is a function of the soil particle type. The finer the soil particles, the larger this range of freezing and thawing temperatures. As a result, what the reality is, is you don't just go from frozen to unfrozen ground. You have frozen ground, partially frozen ground, and unfrozen ground. And that partially frozen zone is called the frozen fringe. And it's my experience when I've modeled it accurately. It, it is a significant thickness, certainly several inches approaching a foot in thickness, so several tens of millimeters approaching 300 millimeters in thickness. And in a lot of problems, that's a, a not insignificant thickness to consider. Well, to close out this section on modeling conductive heat transfer, I want to share with you some observations from the 40 plus years of practice and research that I've been involved in uh, heat transfer in 
geostructural applications. I found that the problems we encounter in practice tend to fall into three broad categories. Natural transient conditions, human-induced transient conditions, and human-induced steady-state conditions. Uh, each of these is usually accompanied by ground cooling, if not ground freezing. Uh, but from time to time, one will be involved in an application where warming of the ground uh, can occur. So I'll touch on that briefly as well. I think this categorization is an efficient way to summarize my experiences and observations with respect to both computational tools as well as uh, the modeling of boundary conditions and uh, freezing front modeling. Well, let me start off with natural seasonal transient conditions. This historically has seen the most interest in associated uh, research and development for the very specific case of seasonal ground freezing in temperate regions, uh, as well as thawing, that impacts both civilian and military infrastructure, such as roads and airfields. And, and to a lesser extent, but still important, utility lines, uh, especially utility lines such as sewerage and water supply lines that are carrying uh, aqueous liquids. And for this category of applications, a one-dimensional analysis using the modified Bergman equation, which supposedly dates back to the early 1950s, really has been for many decades into the present, at least in the United States, is the de facto standard. And I think most people feel that it is proven adequate for the vast majority of cases. Of course, the attraction of the modified Bergman equation is that uh, you can do a manual calculation, but it's very easy to do on a spreadsheet. And there are a couple of organizations that have actually produced application-specific software. You also find that when people publish research about some newer, more accurate method they develop, they tend to use the results from the modified Bergman equation as the baseline against which their results are compared, generally to show that their method is better than the modified Bergman equation. As I indicated earlier, there are some very significant approximations and simplifications that are uh, incorporated into the formulation of the modified Bergman equation. So they're kind of baked in, as they say, to this particular model. Uh, unfortunately, you, you don't see these limitations discussed in publications. I, I wouldn't say they're fatal, but uh, to me, it's very important that if you're going to use a methodology, you should understand its minuses as well as its pluses. First of all, in the modified Bergman equation, the freezing of water in the ground is assumed to occur instantaneously at plus 32F, zero degrees C. So the model assumes a zero freeze fringe, uh, which means the calculated depth of freezing is always overestimated to some degree, all, assuming that all other things are equal and, and accurate. To me, the more significant limitation is the way that the equation assumes that the freezing front, the plus 32F, zero degrees C isotherm, has passed a given point or depth on the ground, is when all the material in, in the material layer above it has frozen. So the implication is that if you have some material that is dry, that it takes zero time for the freezing front to pass through that solid material. Because the modified Bergman equation is really based so much, not so much on the cold finisher thermal conductivity as it is the latent heat effusion. So again, what I'm getting at here is that the modified Bergman equation is built around the latent heat effusion and how much time it takes 
to basically freeze water. So if you have a dry material, it takes zero time. Well, that's a simplification. Not too bad of an assumption for paving materials like asphalt or Portland cement concrete. Uh, these materials tend to have a very high coefficient of thermal conductivity, so heat tends to pass through these materials pretty fast anyway. So to assume that they freeze instantly in zero time, it's approximate, but it's not too bad. Where the problems really come in is if you have a system that you're looking at, what's the benefit of synthetic thermal insulation? The modified Bergeron equation is really going to underestimate the benefit of that insulation because it, it assumes the insulation doesn't do any good until the freeze front is passed through it. And, and that's really a gross approximation and quite incorrect. So if you put all of these assumptions together, that uh, there is no frozen fringe, uh, that uh, the freeze front can move instantaneously through dry materials, the benefit of synthetic thermal insulation is really underestimated when you use the modified Bergeron equation. Now, as for the lower boundary condition, the modified Bergeron equation assumes the ground remains at a constant temperature, and typically this is taken to be the annual, annual, annual average air temperature at a site, so the existence of the geothermal heat flux is ignored. Uh, this isn't too bad. This is pretty reasonable because, as I said, we, we don't tend to see the effect of the geothermal heat flux until we're quite significant depth in the ground. The way the atmosphere ground boundary condition is simulated is using site-specific values of average and uh, average daily air temperatures, uh, typically in the form of degree days below freezing. So it'll be so many degree days Fahrenheit or so many degree days Celsius. Uh, and then this has to be empirically modified. There's a modification factor that depends on the nature of the surface material. As I indicated earlier, if, if a ground surface is paved with asphalt as opposed to vegetation, you're going to have very different surface temperatures and therefore you're going to have different propagation of freezing into the ground. So you can either take this uh, degree days of freezing data either lump it together for the entire season or for arbitrary periods of time. So you, you could do estimates of how the ground freezing progresses, or you could just look at what's the maximum depth of ground freezing, uh, depending on what is of interest to you. Again, experience indicates that this is not a bad way to model seasonal, uh, natural seasonal ground freezing, although there's a lot of subjectivity with this modification factor that you have to use. Uh, and these modification factors have simply been developed from decades of research. Uh, again, it's going, they're going to vary depending on the material covering the ground surface. Uh, nowadays, with the widespread availability of finite el element software, you could do a much, much better job for one-dimensional analysis of seasonal ground freezing. Uh, I, I've done this for decades now. You, you, you need a very simple finite element mesh. I mean, uh, you could set this up pretty quickly, and you're going to get a much better result uh, when synthetic thermal insulation is being analyzed. The freezing process in, in the water in the ground can also be analyzed a lot more accurately using the finite element method. A simple way that I've done this is to assume that water does not freeze at a single temperature, but the freezing is spread out over some temperature range. Uh, for example, 32F to plus 28F, so or 0C to minus 2C. This might be a typical good average or good uh, range for 
sandier soils, coarser grain soils. Uh, it's going to be larger if you have fine grain soils. So the way you do this is essentially, in, instead of assuming the latent heat effusion is applied at a single temperature, you spread out that latent heat effusion over, in this case, 4 degrees Fahrenheit or 2 degrees Celsius. So you can actual, actually model the, uh, uh, the partially frozen zone of soil. And, and of course, you could get much more exotic with your time steps. You could simulate, you know, temperatures going up and down uh, during the course of a freezing season. Next, I want to talk about human-induced transient conditions. And this usually involves a structure bearing on the ground where the interior of the structure is at some temperature, usually well below freezing point of water, for some ex extended period of time that could be months, years, or decades. And examples of this would be frozen food warehouses, ice rinks, petrochemical tanks on grade. Uh, nowadays, these sorts of structures are typically constructed with synthetic thermal insulation underneath them, but there are cases where, uh, in older structures, where this insulation was either absent or deteriorated over time, or for one reason or another, uh, problems developed. Also in this category is artificial ground freezing, which, as is well known, is a uh, ground modification tool that is used uh, related to excavation or tunneling. So basically anything where humans cause the ground freezing and not nature. Well, nowadays, the finite element method is considered the computational tool of choice uh, because the software allows, at least for two-dimensional or actually symmetric mesh, uh, and more and more of the software can handle a true three-dimensional mesh. So you can accur accurately model the, uh, the geometry of the problem. I found that there is no universal suggestion with respect to the boundary condition between atmosphere and ground. Uh, because this really depends on the temporal duration that you're looking at. If you're looking at things over years or decades, then assuming a simple annual average air temperature is generally sufficient. But if you're looking at a shorter duration that's going to be months, weeks, that sort of thing, then uh, you have to get more sophisticated with your uh, boundary condition modeling. Finally, I'd like to talk about human-induced steady-state conditions. Now, this covers the same class of problems I just spoke of, and typically we do a steady-state analysis to kind of give us an upper bound of, or you know, limiting case or what's a worst-case scenario. Uh, because if you have, I mean, let's say you had a problem with a, you know, a frozen food warehouse or something like that. What you don't know up front is how long does it take to approach a steady state condition. So what I always like to do is when I'm confronted with a problem like this, I'll do a steady state analysis first. Because the steady state analysis will give me, okay, what, what's the worst that could happen in the long term? what's the maximum extent of ground freezing. And then you, you could do a transient analysis to see how you approach this. Uh, the thing to remember, and I perhaps should have mentioned this earlier, the thing to remember about uh, ground freezing is that it is a, time-wise, it is a very nonlinear uh, process. It, it reminds me of consolidation classic one-dimensional consolidation in soil mechanics, in that with ground freezing, a lot happens very quickly, and then it slows down. So it's, it's nominally, or you know, qualitatively at least, you can think of it as kind of an exponential process. 
So with both ground freezing and ground thawing, a lot will happen very quickly and then the process slows down. And again, it's the same thing with consolidation. A lot happens very quickly and then it slows down on a arithmetic time basis. So uh, this is why seasonal ground freezing is such a big consideration because even though the duration of the ground freezing may only be a few months, uh, a lot can happen in that few months because, as I said, it's just as the nature, the mathematical, uh, just the physics of things that ground freezing tends to happen very quickly and then slow down. And the same thing with thawing. Thawing happens very quickly and then complete thawing slows down. So it, it is not a linear process in time by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, one thing about steady state analyses is you could use some of these old uh, two-dimensional closed form solutions. It could give you an approximate preliminary answer literally in a matter of a few minutes. I mean, it's, it's, uh, if you have a calculator, and uh, you, you could produce an analysis very quickly. So the, the nice thing about steady state analyses is if you, could, you could get just a really rough idea of you know, what's the worst case scenario of ground freezing with very, very little computational time and effort and resources. The thing I like about these, even these simple closed form solutions is that you can accurately incorporate the presence of synthetic thermal insulation, which again, something like the Modified Bergeron equation does a very poor job of modeling. Another thing is with the steady state analyses is because we're looking at some extended duration of time, it's quite adequate to assume that the atmosphere will simply be the average annual air temperature of the site and the ground will be also at the average annual air temperature of the site. So, Steady state analyses are certainly simplify the boundary conditions as well. Uh, nowadays, uh, a lot of finite element programs can also perform a steady state analysis if you want a more accurate estimate or you have a complex three dimensional geometry that needs to be considered. Well, moving on, just uh, to finish things up here, a couple of uh, segments still to go. The, ne the next segment I want to talk about is heat-induced mechanical behaviors. And I've broken this up into uh, a few topics. Well, let me give you an overview of what I'm talking about in this segment. There are several different force displacement phenomena that can affect the ground or structural element bearing on or in the ground. They're really direct result of, and they typically occur contemporaneously with uh, the heat transfer. So in most geostructural heat transfer problems, the geometries of the problems, both the geotactical and structural, if any, components, change as a direct result of heat flow. So the, the physical geometry does not stay constant. Now, historically, this interaction between heat, force, and displacement has not been modeled explicitly, especially for the ground component. Uh, typically, we perform either a transient or a steady state heat analysis based on the undeformed problem of geometry. And, and this is very conceptually identical to in uh, linear structural analysis where you perform your calculations based on an undeformed structural system. Now this uncoupling or decoupling between heat transfer and force displacement behaviors has really been done for analytical simplicity. I mean, the computational tools that are, have been available in the past uh, can't accommodate the fact that the uh, 
the geometry of the ground is changing as it gets colder or hotter in some cases. And then again, this is very similar to structural analysis. You know, until the availability, widespread availability of the digital computer, it was very difficult for a structural engineer to do a uh, nonlinear structural analysis where the geometry, the, the change of the geometry of the structure under the applied loads was taken into account. So this is now changing nowadays. Uh, with the finite element method that increasingly we can perform uh, more complete analyses that couple the heat force and displacement aspects of the problem. So really what I want to do in this segment is just to summarize what are some of the uh, force displacement issues that we should be thinking about incorporating into a heat transfer analysis. So this is just kind of a, a primer or a fresher in some cases of the force displacement phenomena that are associated with heat transfer in geostructural applications. Let's first talk about the geotechnical aspects. Again, keep in mind that heat transfer can involve both heat removal and heat addition. Now, historically, civil engineers have tended to focus on the heat removal. That's gotten most of the attention because that's perceived as being the more common and more problematic occurrence. And that's because when you remove heat from the ground, this can lead to freezing of water in the ground and you could get frost heave. So this is typically why, you know, with the modified Bergman equation, uh, engineers have been focused on, you know, what's the maximum depth of frost penetration uh, and trying to get some idea of frost heave that will result from that. However, if you think about it, the issue of heat addition is really the, the larger, more common problem because it can have different, several different consequences. Well, the most obvious one is that you get thawing of the soil that was previously frozen. And as we'll see in a minute, this thawing can have multiple negative consequences. In addition, when you heat the soil, you can have negative consequences that have nothing to do with the phase change of water. I mean, uh, you can create problems by heating the ground that are independent of ground freezing. So let's though first talk about heat removal, which is historically the aspect that we focus on more. Freezing of the ground is accompanied by varying amounts of frost heave that result from the fact that, as we know, water expands approximately 9% in volume when it freezes into the most common type of what we call type 1 ice. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, there are different forms of ice. I think they've identified something like, what, 15 forms of ice to date. So here's uh, on this diagram. Here is atmospheric pressure. Here is 0 degrees C, 32, plus 32 degrees F. So this is the line of atmospheric pressure across here. And we see the transition from liquid water to uh, what's called uh, type 1 ice. That's normal ice. However, really, the bigger problem is not just the freezing of the water that's already in the voids of the soil, but it's the additional water that's drawn up from the capillary fringe uh, due to unsaturated flow. And this is really now involves unsaturated soil mechanics. Now, the additional water that can be drawn up during the freezing process really can vary enormously. It depends on the duration of heat removal. It depends on the soil type. 
generally the finer the soil type, the much bigger the problem that will occur. And uh, also the depth to the cap capillary fringe. So the point I'm getting at here is that how much frost heave you get when you freeze the ground. Rather interestingly, it, it is not so much the depth of the freezing that is important, but it is the nature of the soil in which that freezing is occurring. So what I'm getting at is all things being equal, if you had, for example, if you had a certain depth of freezing in gravel, you would probably get little or no frost heave. Uh, even in a sandy soil, the amount of frost heave would be modest. But now you start getting down into siltier soils, uh, the amount of frost heave uh, can be enormous. Now, interestingly enough, it's a trade-off between particle size and permeability. So one might think that clay soils would have the greatest frost potential. Well, they do, but it, 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 they would have to freeze over years or decades. So if we look at typical seasonal ground freezing as occurs in temperate climates, uh, actually, if you, the, the most what we call frost susceptible soils uh, are silts. Uh, a very fine sandy silt or a slightly clay silt, but the silty type soils that are most frost susceptible because they are the worst combination of uh, significant capillary fringe, yet still a reasonable permeability. Well, let me illustrate how all this fits together. So we, we've previously, I've, I've shown you uh, the, the key elements here. Uh, we now appreciate that we always have a capillary fringe uh, the capillary fringe can vary widely. You know, if you had a gravel, this capillary fringe could be a fraction of an inch, a couple millimeters, insignificant, irrelevant. But certainly we start getting it down into the siltier soils. Now we're starting to see capillary fringes of several feet getting up into the meter or so range. Now initially, prior to any heat removal from the system, we could assume that for simplicity, let's say that the ground is at the annual average air temperature. Uh, now, as we start to remove heat during seasonal cooling, and by the way, the same thing would occur if we were doing artificial ground freezing. So I'm, I'm focusing on, on natural heat removal due to uh, you know just winter time in a temperate climate. But certainly, if we were doing artificial ground freezing, the, the basic physics would be identical. Although, obviously, the rate of heat removal is going to be very different if you have artificial ground freezing. So what happens is the, the weather gets colder. Uh, we start to see this seasonal variation in ground temperature. The ground temperatures will start to decrease and the freezing front will tend to propagate into the ground. Now, I have not shown a frozen fringe here. I, I've, this is for simplicity. I'm showing a sharp transition between the frozen Vado zone and the still unfrozen Vado zone. Uh, this is just for simplicity of illustration and discussion of these points. In reality, of course, you're going to have a frozen fringe where you have a transition from frozen, partially frozen, to unfrozen. Well, what happens as the freezing front progresses, you set up unsaturated flow. And, and, and the way to understand why this happens is to think simplicity uh, in, in a simplistic manner, that this soil has a uh, a natural desire to hold on to water. And, and this comes from partially saturated soil mechanics. So it's going to have, just based on its, its natural particle size distribution, it's going to have a certain uh, matrix suction that it's going to look for for, uh, for steady state conditions. 
Well, what happens when that water in the ground freezes, you can kind of think of that as the soil sensing that the soil dried out. And it dried out because now the, the water is not in the liquid phase anymore, it's in the frozen phase. So because the soil thinks it has dried out, it sends out a call, I need more water. So it's going to draw up additional water from the capillary fringe in unsaturated flow. And of course, the capillary rise from the groundwater table will keep on feeding to keep this capillary fringe saturated. So I think you could see that the relative volume of water that is being drawn up here really is a complex function of a lot of different things. How deep is it to the groundwater level? Uh, how high is the capillary fringe? So how far does this water have to travel? Because I think you could see that we have conflicting things going on here. On the one hand, how much water wants to be drawn up depends on the particle size distribution of the soil. The finer the soil, the more water wants to be drawn up. But on the other hand, how quickly that water can be drawn up depends on how far it has to go and what is the coefficient of permeability of the soil. Well, the finer the soil, the lower the permeability. So we see that how much additional water is drawn up during the freezing process, the ground freezing process, is a very, very complex function. It's going to vary from site to site because it depends on, as I said, the depth to the groundwater table, the depth to the, how thick the capillary fringe is, how high the capillary fringe is, how far the water has to travel to the freezing front, the permeability of the soil and the matrix suction potential of the soil as well. Well, as I said, you know, this has been studied many, many times over the, the decades and the kind of the optimum worst case soil conditions are siltier soils. So if you look up what's the most frost susceptible soil, you're always going to see that it is in the silt range. A very, very fine sandy silt to a clayey silt, something in that type of range, because it's kind of the worst case combination of uh, matrix suction potential and permeability. Now it's really the additional groundwater that's drawn up to the freezing front and the ice lenses that often develop. And ice lenses are simply literally discrete lenses of frozen water without any soil particles uh, that are the primary contribution to frost heat. As I said, if you had a very coarse gravel, no matter how deep the freezing penetrated into that soil, you'd probably get insignificant or no frost heat. Well, the, the consequences of frost heaving are many and varied, as you, I'm sure, imagine, because uh, they affect a wide variety of uh, structures, pavements, railway tracks, and even light load structures supported on the ground. I mean, you could have lightly loaded buildings literally jacked out of the ground by ground freezing. And that's because ice can exert significant normal stress when it is subjected to any kind of confinement. I uh, next want to talk about heat addition, which, as I said, I think in a lot of ways, this is actually the larger of the two problems, uh, not to minimize or trivialize frost heaving or the fact that ground freezing could literally jack a, a small building up out of the ground. Uh, I think there are some very significant issues related to heat addition that sometimes we don't pay enough attention to. Uh, two primary outcomes from the, uh, the addition of heat to a geostructural system. One is the thawing of soil that was previously frozen, either naturally due to seasonal ground freezing or human activity. 
Uh, and this also includes the thawing of permafrost due to either human activity or, unfortunately, increasingly due to climate change. The second outcome is the drying of soil that was not previously frozen. Uh, so it's not a ground freezing issue. Uh, and this usually involves a structure, a portion of a structure, supported on the ground in which elevated temperatures exist. Now, examples of this uh, can be some things like a manufacturing facility that includes large furnaces. Uh, this is probably the, the classic problem that you may see in uh, textbooks or written about in a paper where you may have some large furnace that operates you know, day in, day out for many years or decades. Or actually, I've seen something as simple as a residential structure. I've seen cases, uh, for example, in the United States of a single family house, one story house, uh, slab on grade construction, so no crawl space, no basement, very type of, very common type of construction, in many parts of the United States, especially the more southern uh, states, warmer climates. Uh, so just a simple single family house with a fireplace. And uh, just from the use of the fireplace in, in the wintertime, locally dry out the soil underneath and, and cause problems, believe it or not. Now, thawing is by far the more common occurrence and, and overall the more problematic in practice. So I'd like to discuss this in some detail. There, there are two outcomes from the thawing of previously frozen ground. One is that we get a process called thaw consolidation, which is just a variation on the classical one-dimensional consolidation or two- or three-dimensional consolidation that we've all learned about in basic soil mechanics. And that's just the result of squeezing out of excess pore water from the voids of the soil. This, of course, is accompanied by thaw strain that produces thaw settlement to the overall system. Now, the interesting thing is, is that observation tells us that the maximum thaw settlement you'll typically, typically get will be somewhat greater than the original frost heave. So, uh, you know, you hear the old adage, what goes up must come down. Well, when it comes to ground freezing, uh, what goes up tends to come down plus a little bit more. So it just is the way the mechanics of the problem works out that whatever you experienced in frost heave, you'll tend to experience that much and maybe a little bit more uh, in maximum thaw settlement. But really what I want to focus on more is the intermediate condition, uh, the thawing period where uh, you have newly thawed soil, still frozen soil, and never frozen soil all in the same system. Uh, and again, uh, it bears repetition that the process of freezing and thawing is highly nonlinear in terms of time. Uh, it is not a linear process with time. So a lot happens quickly and then it slows down. And, and this could be a real problem in the springtime because uh, you think the ground has thawed out. You hear people talk about, oh, the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the frost is out of the ground. The colloquial expression here in the United States, the frost is out of the ground, meaning that whatever froze during the winter has now thawed out. But it's very deceptive, and you'll see why. Because you may think that thawing has been completed uh, simply because you can't see frozen ground anymore. Yet, if you dug down a bit, the ground still would be frozen. Uh, frozen ground lingers into the spring surprisingly long time, much more than you might think. Well, let's understand how this can happen and, more importantly, what the consequences of this are. Now, again, for simplicity, I'm going to show that we have a sharp transition from the frozen Vado zone to the unfrozen, never frozen uh, Vado zone that uh, there is no frozen fringe uh, here. There is no partially frozen zone of soil. And again, this is just for simplicity. There always will be 
some zone of partially frozen soil in here at this interface. So let's say this is typically springtime scenario. Uh, here we see the temperature distribution in the ground. It has dropped to its seasonal low. It is going to come back up to the annual average air temperature until at some greater depth it's going to increase due to the geothermal gradient. So now as we add heat to the system due to seasonal warming in the spring, the near surface temperatures, of course, will go up. And we will have a thawing front progress into the ground. Now this gets very complicated because you have a thawed portion of the Vado zone. Uh, you actually have a frozen fringe in here. So I, I, sh I don't show this, but in between the thawed and frozen portions of the Vado zone, you've got a partially frozen zone. You've got another partially frozen zone down here, and then you've got the unfrozen, never frozen Vado zone. So this is actually a very complex system. Thawed, partially frozen, frozen, partially frozen, never frozen. Very, very complex system. But in any event, the basic thing to appreciate is that you've got a thawed zone, but you've still got a frozen zone down here. And because of the nonlinearity of this process, this can remain into a surprisingly late date in the spring. You may think that, quote unquote, all the frost is out of the ground because you no longer see it here on the ground surface. And in fact, the ground surface may be downright warm on a nice sunny day. But dig down a foot or two, a few tens of millimeters, and you're going to hit some frozen soil. Now, the, the relevant thing here is that this surficial zone of newly thawed soil can contain a volume of newly thawed water that is not only greater than that which existed, say, in the preceding fall when freezing began, but could even be in excess of the soil's void volume. And this has to do with the fact that much more water can be drawn up and frozen than existed in the soil at the beginning of the freezing process. So this excess volume of water over and above that which existed in the soil prior to or at the onset of freezing is the result of the additional water that has been drawn up from the capillary fringe that we just talked about in some detail. Okay, and I, I just show you this just to remind you that depending on the nature of the soil here, you can draw up a lot more water and freeze that water uh, than existed in the soil at the onset of the freezing process. Now, the problems really develop during this intermediate stage of thawing in areas where the ground surface is covered by a pavement. So this could be a road, uh, could be an airfield, parking lot, you know, any number of things. And this is because the excess water in the newly thawed zone of soil cannot easily drain vertically. Uh, you have impervious frozen soil below it. I mean, when soil freezes, its coefficient of permeability drops to zero. And the pavement above is nominally impervious as well. Now, of course, you can have horizontal drainage, but you know if the pavement covers a significant width, that horizontal drainage is going to be irrelevant. It's, it's mostly a one-dimensional vertical drainage scenario. Well, this is the classic scenario for the development of what I call true potholes. And I call these true potholes because there are a number of pavement failures that we can see in, in civil engineering that are not what I consider to be the, the classic pothole, which is I'm, the classic true pothole. I'm going to explain how that comes about in a minute here. Well, this all develops when a vehicle load is placed on the pavement and it causes an increase in pore water pressure within this no, newly thawed uh, zone of pavement subgrade. Well, of course, we know from soil mechanics that you increase pore pressure, uh, effective stresses decrease, and this is now going to give you a decrease in shear strength within the newly thawed subgrade soils, and you could get a soil failure. 
a shear strength failure. Now, in extreme cases, when the volume of uh, newly thawed water exceeds the void volume of the newly thawed soil, really it's as if uh, the pavement is supported only by a liquid. It's, it's you have a kind of a variation on liquefaction where the pore pressures are so high, the effective stresses drop to zero and therefore by definition, the, the shear strength drops to zero as well. Well, because the pavement is no longer has support or certainly significant support from the subgrade soils, the pavement fails structurally, a hole gets punched in the pavement layer and the classic pothole is born, if you will. Uh, and, and often the excess pore water is visible inside the hole. Having explained this in words, now let me illustrate it in pictures, and I think you could get a better idea of what's going on. So this is what we have. This is a pavement layer. This is our newly thawed zone of uh, uh, Vado zone, our still frozen Vado zone, and our unfrozen, never frozen Vado zone. And again, for simplicity, I'm showing that the uh, uh, frozen fringe is uh, zero thickness. In reality, you've got a partially frozen zone here and a partially frozen zone there. But I, I'm leaving that out for simplicity to, uh, to illustrate the basic issues. So into this system where now this newly thought soil has low to no shear strength depending on its uh, water content. I now apply a stress. This is now tire pressure from some kind of vehicle or aircraft or, or whatever. Well, what this pavement wants to do, it wants to basically span over this low to no shear strength zone of soil like a beam. Uh, actually, this is a three-dimensional problem, so this is what we would call a structural plate. But for simplicity, if you want to think of this just as a fixed end beam, that's fine. So we have the pavement trying to span like a flexural member, a beam or a plate. Now, as you know, pavements are never designed to behave this way. All pavements, I don't care whether it's asphalt concrete or Portland cement concrete, all pavements are designed to have a continuous support of some minimal level underneath that pavement. In very simple terms, I, I know when I was in academia, I used to tell my students to think of the pavement really as an all-weather wearing surface. It's, it's really more of an oil all-weather wearing surface. That pavement, the point being is that the pavement really is only as good as the subgrade soil underneath it. Of course, it is really the subgrade soil that is providing support to that pavement. That pavement cannot span like a beam, which is what it's trying to do here. Well, what happens, of course, it can span like a beam. It was never designed to span like a beam. So we're going to go get this local hole that is punched. I mean, you basically have a flexural failure of the pavement layer. And this is typically what it looks like on the ground surface. And the, real, the reason it has a nominally circular geometry in most cases is that the whatever vehicle tire caused this stress uh, has a nominally circular geometry to it. Uh, yes, the, the contact zone between the tire and the pavement, it tends to look more like a little bit of a rectangle, but certainly for as a first order approximation, the contact stress from the vehicle tire is more or less a circular applied stress. So you're going to get this circular type of failure. And again, classically, you'll see this water in the hole is very, uh, in the pothole, this classical true pothole is the pore water, excess pore water in this newly thawed Vado zone. And if you were to dig under here, you would find actually the soil underneath here is still frozen. And this is what's trapping this water here. 
Now, the second and much less common consequence of heat transfer that causes heat addition in a geostructural system is simply the drying of soil that was not previously frozen. Uh, this occurs, as I mentioned a little while ago, with some constructive facility that as part of its normal operation transfers heat to the ground a, on a regular, if not continuous, basis. So where, where this has been found most commonly has been in some sort of industrial uh, facility where you have furnaces or other heat sources that operate. Uh, very often they operate around the clock, seven days a week. Uh, but I've also seen this happen with something as simple as a single family house with sing slab on grade construction where this problem was caused by the use of the fireplace in the winter time. If the soils underneath the structure are moisture sensitive, what we sometimes colloquially call swelling clays, for example, uh, there can be long-term shrinkage, and uh, as a result, you'll get long-term settlement that is occurring. So although certainly we can have volume change with moisture-sensitive soils that is unrelated to heat, and, and that's usually the more common problem that uh, uh, people talk about, uh, there is an interesting small category of problems where with these moisture-sensitive soils, you, you could get uh, volume change issues uh, developing as well. I'd like to move on now to the structural problems that can that are related to uh, uh, heat-induced mechanical behaviors. Well, to begin with, as we all know, all structural materials react to thermal changes. Uh, but the physical nature of that reaction depends on the confinement imposed on that material in a specific application. Uh, it's useful to just talk about the two limiting, classical limiting cases. Uh, this is typically what uh, most of us learn in undergraduate structural analysis. Uh, basic problem of a relatively slender bar, cross-sectional area A, material Young's modulus E, it undergoes a reaction in its longitudinal direction to a temperature change delta T along its entire length. Well, one limiting case is the so-called free bar case where there's no confinement at one end of the bar so that all thermal change occurs as a length change delta L. Uh, and you see that change in length is function of the original length change in temperature and I'll define this parameter alpha in a second. It, it is not thermal dif diffusivity. Uh, the other limiting case, the fixed bar case, represents perfect confinement, so zero longitudinal displacement. As a result, you get a change in axial force, delta P, and again, it's a function of the axial stiffness, AE, of the bar, and the change in temperature, and this parameter A. Now, both equations, uh, Alpha is the coefficient of uh, linear thermal expansion. Very often you'll see the word lim linear omitted. Uh, and it should not be confused or conflated with thermal diffusivity. It's just an unfortunate case of co two completely different material properties, in this case related to temperature, that have the same notation. One of the more interesting things I always thought was that the coefficient of thermal expansion is essentially the same for steel and Portland cement concrete. So uh, rather independent of primary structural material. It's of interest that the, the longitudinal expansion in the free bore case is independent of the cross-sectional area or the Young's modulus of the material. Whereas in the fixed bar case, the axial force is independent of uh, the length of the bar. Now, of course, in the real world, you're typically going to have a restraint condition that is somewhere in between these two limiting cases. The point being is you're going to get some length change and you're going to get some force change. Now, what that 
relative amount of length change and force change is, since most problems are statically indeterminate, it, it becomes a stiffness issue. It's uh, going to be governed by the overall stiffness of the problem. Now, nowadays, finding Elman software can re readily handle the coupling of thermal and mechanical behaviors. So uh, it, it, it is not a big deal anymore to uh, have the analysis automatically take into account the thermal reaction uh, to structural materials. I'm now going to move on to the last major segment of my presentation, and that is with respect to thermal insulation. Uh, you recall that thermal insulation I defined earlier in this presentation as being in the category of true solids, but uh, thermal insulation has some unique characteristics that uh, warrant a separate discussion of this class of materials. And again, I've broken this uh, segment up into uh, several topics. Start off with some background. In my opinion, synthetic thermal insulation is more important than ever in geostructural engineering. Uh, there are so several fundamental aspects of thermal, synthetic thermal insulation in general and in particular in geostructural applications. One is to appreciate that unlike electrical insulation, which can effectively stop the flow of electricity, uh, thermal insulation can never stop the flow of heat. At best, thermal insulation can only retard heat flux, and it retards the heat flux due to a relatively low value of the coefficient of thermal conductivity of the thermal insulated material. So it's interesting to note you can never completely stop the flow of heat, but certainly you can very, very significantly uh, retard that heat flux. Because thermal insulation acts as a retardant to heat flux, it turns out that it is most efficient in applications involving relatively short duration transient conditions, such as seasonal ground freezing. So because thermal insulation is a retardant, it turns out that for things like seasonal ground freezing, duration of several months, uh, thermal insulation is very effective. A little bit goes a very surprisingly long way. And you find in such applications, even a couple of inches, a few tens of millimeters of a thermal insulative product will have a very significant benefit. And benefit here being, meaning for example, if you wanted to prevent the penetration of uh, the freezing front into the ground, a relatively modest thickness of thermal insulation placed in the ground can, can achieve this compared to the no insulation baseline case. On the other hand, if you have a long duration condition, right, you have some sort of structure that's going to be in use for years or decades, uh, considerably more thermal insulation is required. And I found typically an order of magnitude more. So, you know, instead of two to four inches or a few tens of millimeters, you might need two to four feet, uh, something of the order of a, a meter of insulation. Uh, this is why in a lot of situations involving things such as frozen food warehouses or uh, petrochemical tanks, things like that, uh, because the, the thickness of thermal insulation that would be required to prevent the freezing of the ground underneath these structures over the period of decades would be very significant. It is not uncommon that these applications have some insulation, but they also have some uh, artificial ground heating, usually in the form of... Uh, electrical resistance heaters, basically wires that are strung through the ground to, uh, to keep the ground just above freezing. It's important to understand that what gives any thermal insulated material uh, its characteristics is not the solid material, 
but the gas and then generally air in the long term that is trapped within the voids of the solid component. I mean, for example, just take wood. Everybody knows that wood is a very good, relatively good natural thermal insulator. Well, what makes wood a thermal insulator is the fact that if you look at it under a microscope, there are plenty of voids inside that wood. And it's really those voids that are pro providing the thermal insulation. It's very important to understand because if the voids in synthetic thermal insulation are comprised in any way, and this can either be that you crush the voids or you fill them with water, for example, the thermal insulator properties of the material are compromised. In fact, they can they could disappear. Um, so very important when you're using thermal synthetic thermal insulation in any application, that it's really the integrity of the voids in that material are really paramount to the success or failure of that material as thermal insulation. Now, geostructural applications are probably the most severe applications for synthetic thermal insulation because they're almost always load-bearing in nature. And when you combine the load-bearing requirement with just in-ground durability, uh, especially with regard to water absorption, water absorption is the death, if you will, of any thermal insulation. Thermal insulation gets wet. <laughs> it no longer insulates thermally. Uh, certainly, anybody, you know, you wear a pair of, insulated gloves in the winter, those gloves get wet, they're, they're worthless, your hands are going to freeze. And the same thing with clothing. Uh, clothing gets wet in the winter time, all of its thermal insulator properties are lost. So geostructural applications of ther synthetic thermal insulation are probably the most severe you're going to find. It's very important to keep in mind because most people, their exposure to synthetic thermal insulation is in above ground applications, particularly if you own a house. I mean, you know that there's insulation in the walls of the house. There's insulation in the, the uh, either the roof or the ceiling uh, in the attic, the floor of the attic of the house. So you, you're probably familiar with thermal insulation and above ground applications, which are much less severe. First of all, they're not load bearing. Uh, in general, and uh, generally they're not exposed to significant uh, amounts of water. Okay, let's talk about uh, materials. A very wide range of thermal insulated materials that have been uh, tried uh, and used in constructive facilities in general. Uh, we have Plant materials such as cork, uh, mineral fibers, uh, also called mineral wool, glass fibers, vitreous or glass fibers. And again, you see you know, under magnification, really, it's not the solid fibers that are providing the insulation. It's the fact that the way that these fibers are placed in a very open, fluffy arrangement that there are uh, lots of airspace in between, and it's that airspace in both cases that is providing the thermal insulation. Uh, well, I mean, for example, glass fiber, very, very popular uh, thermal insulation product above ground, used in, uh, for example, the walls and ceilings or whatever of single family houses, residential construction in general, uh, because it's relatively inexpensive in the scheme of things, but if you crush this material, you've basically crushed the, uh, the thermal insulated properties out of it. Another problem with these open materials is what they call thermal washing. In other words, as the wind blows through these materials, since they're open, uh, they lose their thermal insulative ability. You have uh, what's called cellular glass, which is a vitreous closed cell phone. And probably the largest category nowadays are various closed cell polymeric or what are colloquially called plastic foams. 
Well, various products made from these materials have been widely and successfully used as thermal insulation in above ground construction for many, many decades. And of course, are used more than ever nowadays because of the focus on energy savings. Uh, polymeric or plastic foams in particular are very efficient thermal insulators because some of them are as much as 99% gas filled voids or cells by volume and only 1% solid material. And as we'll see, these gas filled voids are closed cells. So you, you generally don't have the same thermal washing issues that you could get with some of these open fibrous products where if the wind blows through them, the wind blows what literally blows away the thermal insulative value. And again, I can't emphasize enough that it's the gas filled void spaces in any material that provide it with thermal insulative properties. And conversely, if those void spaces are compromised in some way, they're crushed, they're filled with water, you lose the thermal insulative properties when that happens. Now, people have been using synthetic thermal insulation in uh, geostructural applications since around 1960. So this is not a new idea. It's been used for uh, well over 60 years at this point in time. And the vast majority of the materials I listed on the preceding slide really have not proven to be durable in a geostructural application. Again, in a geostructural application, you have load bearing, and you also have just this severe natural environment and with access to water, even if you're above the groundwater table, there's still gonna be water vapor in the voids of the soil. Well, more than 60 years of research and experience have shown that really the only thermal insulative materials that work in a geostructural application are either cellular glass or a family of products that are called rigid cellular polystyrene is the generic name. And there's two types of RCPS. We have expanded polystyrene or EPS. And in the United States, this is, this is the classical white foam that you find, uh, the same stuff that they make coffee cups out of, for example. And you have extruded polystyrene or XPS. In the United States, this is always gonna be colored. Uh, for example, it's gonna be blue or pink or green or yellow, depending on the manufacturer. Uh, and by the way, notice I do not use the word styrofoam, okay? Uh, styrofoam is a, um, I, I know that most Americans use, think styrofoam is a generic term for any type of plastic foam. It is not. Uh, styrofoam is a registered trademark of a particular brand of extruded polystyrene, XPS. Very, very simple. If you see a piece of plastic foam, if it is colored blue, then it is Dow Chemicals Styrofoam, okay? And believe me, Dow Chemicals attorneys have made sure of that, that only their brand of extruded polystyrene could be colored blue. Uh, if you see foam that is colored pink or green or yellow, it's an extruded polystyrene made by some other company. If you see foam that is white, that is uh, generic expanded polystyrene that could be made by many, many dozens of different companies. Uh, EPS or expanded polystyrene, if we, we want to take a little bit closer look at what gives it its uh, thermal insulative ability. When you manufacture EPS, you basically start off with what are called pre-puff. And this is the raw material that has been expanded about 50 times in volume into these little spheres. If we were to focus on one of these spheres, we see that this is now enlarged about 18 times. This is a typical pre-puff particle, and these are thermally fused together to make the final EPS product. So we see all of these. Here's a typical contact between two pieces of pre-puff. This is a thermal bond, okay? There's no glue or anything else. This is just strictly a thermal bond during the manufacturing process. 
if we focus a little bit more closely, this is now more than 300 times magnification. Here we see the really uh, the classical cellular structure of expanded polystyrene. We see that uh, why only 1% of this material is solid, just forming the walls of these uh, cells. And we see that we have these gas filled voids or closed cells. And this is what gives the material its uh, superior thermal insulative uh, ability. And just the way that these, the solid material is aligned, uh, despite the fact that this product may only be 1% solid material, it's 99% voids, the solid material is distributed in a very efficient fashion. So it can have a surprising load bearing capability. Extruded polystyrene starts off with the same raw material, more or less, but goes through a different manufacturing process. So your cellular structure is a little bit different, but still you see the basic, very thin walls of solid polystyrene with lots of open void spaces in between that to provide the thermal insulation. So cellular glass and, and rigid cellular polystyrene, EPS and XPS, are now recognized of types of geofoams. This is a word I'm sure all of you have heard now. Uh, geofoam is a three-dimensional geosynthetic in the cellular geosynthetics category. Uh, another geosynthetic, cellular geosynthetic are what are called geocombs, which have an open cell structure. Nowadays, uh, throughout the world, rigid cellular polystyrene, either EPS or XPS, is the predominant synthetic thermal insulated material in, again, thermal insulated material in geofoam stru geostructural applications. Not geofoam in general, right? In thermal insulative applications. If you're looking at geofoam applications in general, that's strictly going to be EPS. So I'm sure many of you now are familiar with large blocks of EPS being used as a lightweight film material. Uh, for other geofoam functional applications like lightweight fill, EPS is by far the material of choice. But in thermal insulation applications, EPS and XPS really are head to head. They're very actively and aggressively competing for the same market share for in-ground thermal insulation. Cellular glass is a very efficient in-ground thermal insulation material, but it's also relatively expensive in the scheme of things. It can be difficult to work with. So you tend to see it used for things like tanks on grade, where there's a very severe requirement for fire resistance, as well as significant load bearing capability. So cellular glass is a very efficient uh, geofoam material for thermal insulation. But for cost and other reasons, its, its applications tend to be very limited to various petrochemical facilities. Well, let's now talk about material properties. Now, in above ground applications, it is common to assume that the coefficient of thermal conductivity of EPS and XPS uh, is a function only of material density and temperature. And if you look in ASTM standards and manufacturer's product literature, which just parrots ASTM standards, uh, these are the values that you typically find. Uh, however, research and experience in geostructural applications, and these are primarily insulated road pavements uh, going back to 1960. And, and it's important to understand that EPS and XPS were used in geostructural applications for more than 30 years before they were referred to as geofoams. So geofoams as a material are not new. What, the only thing that is somewhat new still is the term geofoams. Uh, these materials have been in, used in ground for more than 60 years now. So there's a real wealth of knowledge about how they behave. They're, they're not experimental materials by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, they've been used longer in the ground than the vast majority of uh, 
other geosynthetics, you know, like geotextiles and geomembranes and geogrids that we use routinely without thinking very much. One of the things that R&D, uh, as well as simple experience, has shown that these polymeric foams, when placed in the ground, will accumulate and retain water over time, even when they are placed above the groundwater table. So simply due to the fact that there is uh, liquid water and water vapor in the voids of the soil, this will accumulate within the closed cells uh, over time. Now, of course, the, the relevance to the present discussion is that water absorption will compromise, to some degree, the coefficient of thermal conductivity. As I said several times earlier, that one of the, any any time you use synthetic thermal insulation, you have to worry about compromising the airspace, if you will, inside the material. If the material is crushed and the airspace is lost you've lost the thermal insulator properties. If that airspace becomes at least partially filled with water, you won't lose all the thermal insulation value, but you'll lose some of it. So it's important to understand that if you use these materials in the ground as a geofoam product for thermal insulation, that you need to use a reduced value uh, or I should say an increased value, all right? Because as we talked earlier, the smaller the coefficient of thermal conductivity, the better the insulated value. So you need to adjust, let's say, the value of the coefficient of thermal conductivity for some long-term water absorption, which is going to occur, all right? It's guaranteed to occur. You certainly don't want to use the dry as-built values that you find in ASTM standards and manufacturers product literature. They will not be appropriate in the long term. There was some a very significant research done in Norway in the 1970s. More than any other country, they had used uh, geofoam materials as thermal insulation for roads and airfield pavements and railways uh, since about 1960, if not a bit earlier. And if we look at their experience with synthetic thermal insulation in transportation facilities, predominantly roads and railways up to that point in time, we can learn a few things. For example, most of their results were for relatively thin panel-shaped products, as, a, as I said earlier, because the process of heat removal from the ground or heat addition to the ground is highly nonlinear time-wise. A lot happens very quickly. So that when you're using synthetic thermal insulation to protect against transient seasonal ground freezing, you don't need a lot of material. Relatively thin panels will be sufficient. So most of what I'm, I'm gonna be summarizing here is based on this experience. The two uh, polystyrene foams absorb water very differently. And this appears to be due to the fact that even though they're both polystyrene foams, the manufacturer uh, processes are drastically different. So the final products have very different cellular structures. And again, this just summarizes what I showed you earlier that yes, there are similarities, uh, but there are also some significant differences as well. One of the things that's interesting is that the water content of EPS, that's the white foam, will tend to go up and down with time, uh, whereas the water content of extruded polystyrene, XPS, which is the typically the colored foam, uh, will just continue to increase with time. It's like a one-way monotonic increase. You have to be careful when you see data about average water contents because the vertical distribution of water contents is very different between the two materials, which means that product thickness is certainly a significant variable in terms of long-term water absorption. And again, this appears to be due to the different manufacturing processes and the effect on the cellular structures. 
So in summary, when you use synthetic thermal insulation in the ground, these materials are going to absorb water with time, even above the groundwater table. This is going to affect the long-term thermal insulative behavior of these materials, and you need to take this into account when you design for the long term with these materials. One thing to be careful about when you're looking at published results is when they talk about water contents in these materials, they are almost always calculated on a volumetric basis. And I emphasize that because civil engineers, certainly geotechnical engineers, are more used to a gravimetric basis. I mean, when we talk about water content of soils, we typically calculate that water content on a gravimetric basis. It's the weight of the water divided by the weight of the solids times 100 to give you a percent. And the reason I think they use volumetric water content with synthetic foams is really perception. It's really a public relations thing. And this is simply the way the numbers work out. These, these materials, EPS and XPS, have a very low unit weight or dry density, typically about one pound per cubic foot or 16 kilograms per cubic meter. So if you calculate a water contents on a gravimetric basis, you'd get relatively large numbers. They'd look terrible. So it looked bad from a marketing perspective if you were in the industry. If you take the same data, you're not lying, you're using the same data, but you express it on a volumetric basis, the results look better. Just give you a for instance, if you had EPS or XPS that weighed one pound per cubic foot or dry density of 16 kilograms per cubic meter and a volumetric water content of 3%, which is really quite reasonable for a long-term geofoam application for either material. So volumetric water content 3% doesn't sound too bad, right? We think of this in a soil perspective, it sounds downright dry. Well, if you do the numbers, this would be a gravimetric water content of 187%, which would sound like this thing was just dripping water from, from every pore. So same data, just depending on how you want to express it, you get very different numerical values. So it's, it's really, as I said, it's a public relations, it's a PR and marketing issue. Well, to bring this presentation to a close, uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you for your attention. I hope you found this of some interest, some value to you professionally. There, uh, I've authored a number of documents over the years related to heat transfer in the ground. As I've said, I've been working with this since about 1980. Uh, you can find these documents, uh, at least the ones that are available in digital form. Some of my earl earliest work is not available in digital form. But anything that I have available in digital form, I have posted on my ResearchGate uh, webpage, website. And you want, may want to look at these, uh, look for these two research reports in particular. I'll go into a little bit more detail about uh, some of the issues I've talked about here. And also, if you want some basic information about uh, EPS as a geofoam material, not just for thermal insulation, but in general, I have a narrated uh, presentation posted on my YouTube channel that I, I did last year that you may want to look up and uh, a view at your convenience. Well, as a final note, I'm sure you've noticed in a few of my slides, my title slides, that uh, I've had this kind of grayed out image in the background. And in case you're wondering what this is, um, this is actually in Norway. Uh, by the 1970s, it turns out that the Norwegians had thermally insulated every kilometer of mainline railway track in Norway, and uh, this was to prevent frost heaving of the railway track. Now, although you don't get potholes with railway track, certainly frost heaving causes rideability issues because the track alignment uh, 
track surface is irregular. So they actually developed a machine to be able to thermally insulate the track structure after the fact. And you see them using relatively thin panels of uh, thermal insulation. I believe this is expanded polystyrene that is uh, being used for this purpose. So with that, I again say thank you for your attention and interest, and I'll bring this to a close.